everyone, and welcome to The Propcast. My name is Louisa Dickens, co-founder of LMR Ray and board director of the UKPA, and I shall be your weekly host. Each week for 30 minutes, we'll be connecting the VCs, prop tech startups, and real estate professionals globally, and assist in bridging that famous communication gap we all love talking about. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Good morning and welcome to The Propcast and a warm welcome to our guests on today's show, Professor Baum and Andy Saul. Welcome. Hello, Louisa. Mm -hmm. Hi, Louisa. Um, This morning's topic is going to be on the truth about real estate research. So I'll give you an introduction to um, Professor Andrew Baum and Andy Saul. For the past three years, Saeed Business School at Oxford University has been home to the Future of Real Estate Research Group aiming to identify how prop tech will transform the real estate business over the next 10 years. Today, I'm joined by Professor Andrew Baum and Andy Soul, authors of many of the reports published by Oxford, including the latest PropTech 2020, a must read for anyone in the industry. Andrew Baum is the head of the Oxford Initiative and was previously a professor with Cambridge and Reading Universities. He's advised companies such as CBRE Investors and Grosvenor, he is the leading academic in the study of PropTech with his groundbreaking 2017 publication, PropTech 3.0, whose updated PropTech 2020 was released only recently. It is said that he not only wrote the theory, but he put it into practice and now seemingly predicts the future. Andy Saul, as research assistant, has been making his tea and collecting his washing, or so he tells me. <laughs> Alongside Andrew, he has also co-authored reports on the future real estate transactions and occupation. In a previous life, Andy was a professional rugby player with London-based Saracens and England's second team. However, this hardly impressed Andrew as a fellow Leicester Tigers season ticket holder. Um, gentlemen, I'd like to say welcome to the show. It's such a treat to have you both on it together. And I love to chat through the truth about real estate research. Um, so, Andrew, do you, would you like to sort of kick it off with, you know, h- how did you first sort of get into it? Well, one thing, um, one thing we haven't told you, Louisa, and, and that you didn't mention in the introduction is that uh, the reason that Andy and I work together is is uh, partly because I taught Andy's dad at Reading University. Ah. And Andy's dad was a pretty tall second row rugby player, if I remember it right. And <laughs> it's it's really nice to have gone full circle and to be teaching the um, the sons of former students. It's like it reminds me of graduation ceremonies when. When I was a young lecturer at Reading University at the age of 21, I used to find the students quite attractive, dressed up in their graduation kit. And then I realised one day that it was the mothers that I was finding attractive. And <laughs> recently, recently, it's gone to the grandmothers. And I'm, I'm sort of very worried about that. And, and maybe Andy's <laughs> going to have kids soon and I'll end up mentoring them as well, which, which would be quite a thing. Anyway, I've been in real estate research, as you can tell then, for a really long time. I sort of started at Reading in 1970 four or five as a researcher uh, and teacher and um, I've retrained a couple of times, done a PhD in real estate research and finance and been hired in industry, worked at the Pru, at Henderson, CBRE Global Investors, a variety of other places and found myself at Oxford five, six years ago teaching MBA students and executives and trying to work out what it was that they wanted to know and what they wanted to know really was what's the future going to be like. Mm. So uh, that, that's what really kicked off the Future Real Estate Initiative. At what point did you give up on the music career, Andrew? Because uh, me and Andrew both, both like playing, playing a little bit of music. I know that he, he had aspirations of being a musician, which I think I may still harbour a slight bit. But, well, Andrew plays the mandolin. You know, we, we actually had a, a band in Oxford. They do, a, they do an X Factor style. Um, <laughs> My first day working for Prudential in 1987, um, we'd recorded an album which had come out and we had a gig in the Victoria Embankment Gardens. And it was my first day, it was a Monday lunchtime, and I had to wear a big hat in case anybody was wandering down from the Prue and recognised me. So th- that's, it was, I gave up my music career when I realised that, that telling your, your academic and business colleagues that you're a musician doesn't actually go down particularly well. They, they must think you're a bit of a loser, so I, I'm afraid I've given up on my aspirations now. It's never too late, Andre. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, being a old is not going to be easy, I don't think. <laughs> he, he put his arm around me and dragged me into research, realising that I also was never going to make a career in music. Um, 
be Andy, how I guess how Andy, how did you get from sort of obviously you knew each other from obviously through sort of family, but how how did you get from England rugby to Oxford University? What's you know, sport to academia is not it that doesn't happen sort of too regularly. Not saying it can't happen, but how you know, how did that start for you? There are probably three versions of this story. And the first one would be a complete lie, which says I'd, I dreamed of going to Oxford my whole life and I planned and I was very meticulous. The second version, which I kind of stick to, is if you, if you have enough conversations, you talk to enough people, enough doors will present themselves and you can walk through, go down enough paths until you find somewhere where you, you kind of feel comfortable and where you're meant to be. So that's probably how I ended up in Oxford. But the truth is, it was just pure panic and pure luck. My... my Rugby career was sort of, I've made the decision to finish at 28 and I knew I wanted to either go into industry or study. And I'd, I'd applied for Cambridge, who <laughs> I'd, I applied to Cambridge to do three real estate courses at Cambridge and got mm. declined on all three of them. And it just so happened that my good friend who I was out for coffee with, his rugby agent happened to coach the Oxford rugby team who mm-hmm. took me and he said, why don't you give him a ring and just talk to him about Oxford courses? He then put me in contact with the professor of the Sustainable Urban Development course, which is what I ended up taking at Oxford. I just completed my two-year master's. And whilst I was doing that, I decided to reach out to Andrew because actually through the Oxford Careers Office. I went to Oxford Careers Office to talk to them about potential real estate careers and anyone they had within the real estate network. And then they put me in contact with Andrew as a real estate professor at Oxford. And next thing I am doing some reading for him and making his teas, as, as we joked at the start. And yeah, two, two and a half years later, here I am as a full-time research assistant at Oxford. So I joke with my friends that I'm an Oxford scientist, albeit a social scientist, but it's still, uh, still quite, a, quite a fun story to tell. Yeah, you, you're close, Andy, you're close. Is there, so when people think of sort of research, I... Do you think there's something slightly more um, attractive or sexy about reimagining the future of real estate? When I think of real research on, say, traditional real estate just buildings, obviously I'm not a researcher, I'm a recruiter, but it's I'm not automatically thinking, God, I, w- I want to, to learn about that. But when we start talking about what's it going to look like in the future, how does the whole built environment, how, how does it look? Is, do you think that will attract more people to the sector, Andy or, or Andrew? After you, Andy. I, I like to sort of break this into two or three different areas of research. Um, yes, I th- I'll, I'll answer the question directly, then I'll go on my lovely roundabout way of telling tales that I like to do. Um, the first is yes, I, I think it is an, an exciting time to join, join real estate, especially from the, from the tech or the data, data science perspective. However, I think a lot of people in the industry, I like to make jokes about the, the differences in research between sort of what we're doing and what the industry does. I say you've got sort of three, three or four types of research. The, the first is my most hated, and that is what everyone wants to do, is the, is the family fortunes research. So we asked 100 of our clients what they thought will be the next best technology in 10 years' time, and they said, ding, 44% said blockchain, 33% said <laughs> IMT. And I just like, that means nothing. You're asking people that don't know about anything what they think the future's going to be. Yeah. Um, the second is, is kind of like the prop tech expert side, I like to call them. And that's just, you know, the, the clever people that gaze into their crystal balls. I've been in the industry a long time. I've been in develop, I've been in technology and innovation in other industries, and here's what I think will happen. And their, their points of view are equally valid. But there's, there's you know, if, if you flip a coin 10 times, chances are someone will get 10 heads in a row. So there's always going to be one or two that make correct predictions. And then the kind of the third area of research, which is where we sit, is extremely difficult. And that's actually trying to empirically infer what the future might hold based on data about the past. And that is particularly a, a stumbling block, I would say, of research. And so when you, when you want to say, is, it, is research a sexy topic? I think it's all well and good when you see the, the prop expert stood on the stage staring into his crystal ball and telling anecdotes about Uber and Amazon. Yeah. But realistically, I think with, that, where, with Andrew's background coming from a, a real estate research, we are a lot more grounded. So perhaps what we do was, you know, the prop tech reports are to an extent crystal ball gazing. The other reports are largely empirically founded. So um, not as sexy as you might think. Yeah, I guess going through a lot of past data which probably is inaccurate 
must be fairly frustrating and time consuming. But Andrew, surely that's why you've got a great research team behind you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the, you know, the, the role of a university is, I mean, it was a great answer from Andy, and, and the role of a university is to be objective, dispassionate, grounded in fact as much as possible, intelligent, you know, and hopefully ethical. And you don't get a lot of that in the business world, you know, because if only because people are going to be partial, even if they're not being cynically partial, you know, the fact that you're trying to build a business means that you're bound to look at that business through rose tinted spectacles. And so you see on the circuit, you see a lot of um, people promoting things which they probably believe in to some extent, but it suits their book to believe in and to promote and to get up and to, and to try and, capture the you know capture the spirit of the age with young people young entrepreneurs mm. young techies who are genuinely motivated to make the world a better place as well as to make some money for themselves to temper that with with views about what the real estate, real estate industry is really like and what the problems in the real estate industry really are it's it's quite tough and where, where i think we've been lucky is is that people who read the 2017 and 2020 reports think think that we are proponents of tech change and, and innovation actually those reports are I, I think they're reasonably balanced about you know tempering the excitement and the evangelism of the techies with with the sort of the conservatism of the property market and you know trying to research the future is impossible clearly you know we, we've got no measures by which we can research the future so we, we're we're playing a pretty hard game and it's it's going to be a challenge to keep the keep the thing fresh and alive and exciting yeah well, that's what I guess brings me on to my next question, Andrew. Sort of having written many sort of educational books and theory, I guess you just mentioned it's so difficult to sort of write about the future of business. We just saw this with the pandemic that came out of sort of nowhere. Have you had one sort of prediction, one sort of part of research which which you wrote about which has come true? Like your, yeah. Yeah, hundreds, hundreds. I mean, because I've made <laughs> thousands of predictions. You know, so... Uh, and, uh, the, uh, forecasters know that it's easy to get your forecast right. You just have to forecast lots and forecast the opposite thing. So you say, will Donald Trump be elected president? You say yes to some people and no to other people. Yeah. <laughs> right, 50% of the time. I mean, I'm being a bit cynical because forecasting is really a bit of a fool's game. You know, I don't think we should really try to make overt forecasts of the future. I, I really learned the lesson. I should have learned it years ago, but I learned it in 2016 when I forecast that I would, I'd have to do a quarterly round with clients forecasting the property market for the next five years, you know, which sector should you invest in, which not. And I said at one presentation, February 2016, I think it was, that Donald Trump couldn't be elected president of the US, that the UK could not vote for Brexit, and that Leicester City <laughs> could win the Premier League. And I got, I got naught out of three. And that absolute was absolute shocker. <laughs> it was a shocker. It was absolutely shocker. I was delighted about Leicester City winning the Premier League, but... I wasn't talking about the other two things. And I realised that your forecasts are tempered by your innermost emotions. So I didn't want Donald Trump to be elected, so I went around saying he wouldn't be, and I didn't want us to leave the European Union, so I, I went around saying that we wouldn't vote to leave. And I wanted Leicester City to win the Premier League so badly, I couldn't believe they could possibly do it. You know, So my emotions got in the way of my brain. And I think my brain is now telling me that that you making forecasts is very difficult. All you can say is that the world is uncertain and there are certain things going on that could lead to certain outcomes. And so we have to talk about scenarios for the future rather than over forecasts of, of what will happen, I think. Yeah, for, I guess throughout these sort of forecasts which you've previously done and sort of research, obviously coming from, you know, Oxford, Reading, and being sort of professor. How, how, how many times do you sort of get challenged? I mean, uh, I've seen quite a lot of people take it for gospel, but do you have sort of people sort of propping up writing sort of whether it's a, I don't know, a journal or something saying, no, I completely disagree with this? Um, that was a good BBC article this week, wasn't there, Andrew? I, that just sprung a nice little... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to read Ken's letter out to you if I could find it. I, so we, we, there was something in the BBC on Saturday on its online news about retailers not being able to afford to pay their rents. And I was interviewed and tried to put the point that you shouldn't see this as a society full of rich, undeserving landlords exploiting poor, deserving tenants. You know, the landlords are often pension funds looking after the savings of old ladies in Wales and the, the tenants are sometimes 
US private equity fund finance leverage to the hilt businesses that are, you know, trying just trying to make as much money as they can and and might even claim relief from the UK government when the US fund has taken all the money out of the business in the first place. So I was trying to set the record straight on that and I got a letter from from Kenneth who runs the Phoenix nightclub in Soho saying that <laughs> I said, why don't these businesses save for a rainy day? And he said, and you're going to have to bleep this bit out, but he said, well, it's been pissing down for years, was his, um, was his phrase. And he was standing there with his, with his paintbrush trying to keep the thing going while, um, while he was getting no income, no support from government. And I said, fair enough, Ken, I'll come and paint, I'll come and paint with you for a day or two because I can understand <laughs> the situation. So you do get pushed back. You get pushed back from... If you know what well, Oxford needs to be in the news, if you want your research to be meaningful, you need to promote it and get it out into the press. Mm-hmm. So you've got to be prepared to be rebutted by the by the general public and other academics will often challenge. But that's a pretty small world that that is very introverted. And the, the other challenge really is from business, where you get people who, like I said, they might genuinely believe that their their business area is is special. They are inevitably tainted by their own personal desires. Mm. Uh, and their emotions and therefore you know you can get into debates with people about whether this whether blockchain is really important whether it's going to happen or not whether tokenization is a good thing or not whether crypto all that stuff and usually Mm. there's somebody with a commercial interest on the other side of the argument yeah well i guess no publicity is bad publicity and if you're getting if someone's challenging you the good news is people are reading your reports and taking notice because i'm sure there's you know there's so much um, information and sort of data and sort of sites out there it's this is i guess leads me on to my next question but out of all of these sort of sites if people want to learn about this space obviously they should read your report but you know creta unisu place tech is are there any if you want to find out more about this space well where, where, where do you recommend they sort of find it well for you andy i mean i've mentioned info yeah, yeah. great source but beyond that andy yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned my actually, I subscribe to all the weekly emails from uh, Unisu, Propmodo, Placetech, Infobode. Yeah. And there's one more, and, C- and Cretech, as you call them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and CRE Tech. And the, the other thing that I think is actually really quite interesting is, is social media. I kind of didn't, didn't purposefully mock the prop tech experts earlier, but what they are is extremely well read. And so yeah. if you follow those guys on social media, <clears throat> you only need to follow two or three before they all start retweeting and messaging each other and you realize who the other 10 are. Mm. Suddenly you see all the reports that they're, they're discussing in their, in their social media posts and they can be highly informative, not only to understand, not only to read the report and understand, but to actually hear their opinions and their debates on the topic. Yeah. Actually, for someone like myself that doesn't particularly have a real estate background, I learned a lot just from reading and, and listening to, to their conversations with each other, kind of a bit voyeuristically. Kind of, you know, they didn't know as I was just sneaking into their Twitter and, and, and reading their threads and stuff. So yeah, will will Said Business School be bringing out like a, a special sort of prop tech course in the near future, or what are the big plans there, Andrew, if any? Oxford's been talking about and, and delivering some online programs in fintech, blockchain, a variety of other areas, and, and prop tech is on the list for the, for the next set of iterations. I think right now the university is having to think very hard about how much of its teaching goes online and how much of it is face-to-face. Yeah. So those, those plans are getting sort of wrapped up in, in those discussions, so I suspect it's, it's probably 75% likely that there'll be a prop tech course in the next couple of years, yeah. Yeah, bro. But going back to when we were sort of discussing so the future changes that were occurring, you know, in your in your report, Future Real Estate 3.0, you discuss, you know, smart real estate, real estate fintech, the real estate shared economy, data digitalization and smart cities. Andrew, out of all of these, which person do you see most change happening? Just this is a forecast, not definitely will, but um, and yeah, where do you see the most change? I'm, I'm happy to go for that one. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's all about it's all about data and digitalization. You know, everything follows from that. The, the furthest, the furthest away, you know, it's easy to make these predictions because you can never define what I mean by furthest away. But smart cities are a long way away. If if by smart cities you mean sort of efficient data using gatherings of buildings and people, that I think we're a way away from that. The, the first thing is is data digitalization because yeah. as as some of the reports that we've put out have said, you know, it, it all starts with digitalizing 
property information um, that can then be used in more efficient transactions and better better decisions. So digitalization definitely, and and the best you know the, the businesses that are easiest to back out there are the ones that are just trying to work in in making the data work in the property industry because it's been pretty bad so far. Yeah, um, Andy, would you agree with this? To an extent, yes. So Andrew looks at this from almost like an analysis forecasting point of view, sort of the processes of real estate, whereas smart building, the smart building sector is more to do with the actual physical construction side of real estate, how it operates. And I think with things like the um, climate emergency, now the coronavirus pandemic, I think there is a massive transition going on in how we actually physically equip our buildings. And I think that's going to be hugely accelerated in smart buildings. It's a lot more tangible. The real estate world understands, you know, rent per square foot and everyone has a, a kind of vested interest, well, apart from the tenant, but everyone has a vested interest in trying to increase the rent per square foot. So I think that buildings will only get smarter, more technology equipped. The, the one thing I would also point out is that these three realms, that, well, these four or five realms you, you mentioned that we discuss in our reports, shouldn't necessarily be viewed independently. Mm. Whilst we, we describe them independently because it's very easy to break them up, a lot of the technologies cross over. So a smart building technology that can monitor occupancy and thus more efficient utilization of desks can just as easily create a shared economy proposition whereby the desks that are unutilized are sold on a secondary market or rented That's on a secondary great market. Point. Great point, Andy. I mean, since we wrote, you know, between the 2017 and 2020 report, we've seen the smart building movement and the shared economy stuff merge together haven't we pretty much yeah and then the thing that that'll do is that'll spin off data around what desks and what offices are in demand when which will completely change valuation models that will then change cash flow modeling and then you'll get this digitalization of data that will then be used to inform transactions so it shouldn't be seen as one set separate worlds it is all about data digitalization at the end of the day mm. but but that will occur in very different sector is all kind of intertwined that yeah. was a really vague answer at the end but that was the best i could do i think yeah it's unanimous sort of agreement on data digitalization and sort of driving it i guess through through this all this sort of change innovation obviously leads to some sort of concerns around whether it be sort of say job security from the traditional real estate industry so if we're look, focusing on data digitalization me as a recruiter when i'm working with the real estate investment funds to the globe, you know, the Jones Lang themselves, to the startups, they're all hiring, you know, people like data scientists or data analysts. There's been a creation of lots of other sort of new roles, but do you, I'm, I'm trying to basically explain to a lot of people that I'm working with, there's, you know, there will be jobs creation. It's not just going to be purely focused around sort of data and, you know, you have to have gone to study machine learning, but do you, you know, are there any sort of skills which you think people can sort of build on to sort of, I guess, future-proof their jobs in the future coming from the real estate world, Andrew? You know, yeah, let's have a go at that. I mean, I think the most, the most valuable skill is one that I think Andy's got. And I, I think that that is going to be the most valuable in the real estate industry for the next 10 to 20 years. And that's going to be personal relationships, capital raising, ra raising money to invest, you know, the, we, we know that the world could be a much better place. We know that there is a huge amount of money out there that needs to get invested. What's mm. needed is the, is the bringing together of all those opportunities with all that money. And, yep. and that, that isn't done through an app. You know, we, that is done through personal trust and ambassadorial skills. And those ambassadorial skills, you know, need to be employed by, by, by tech startups that, that have commercial officers, business development officers, whatever you call them, who desperately need to go out and raise money. But you've also got the big property companies, the, the fund managers, the, you know, they need to raise capital as well. And that capital will then find its way into the right things eventually, you know, the best buildings, energy efficiency, sustainability, all the things that we need, we know the, the world needs, you know, you need people to go out and raise that capital. So that's going to be the most valuable skill, I think. Yeah. Um, Andy? Yeah, I, I, it reminds me of a, a, a nice story that I heard um, Jules Barker at British Land once tell. I forget the development. I'm going to use, uh, yeah, forgive me. I, I want to say Paddington, but I'm not sure if, they, if that was where they developed. But he said that they planted, you know, thousands of trees 30 years ago, and that cost them money, not because they would receive a higher rent 30 years ago because they were, you know, seedling trees around, but because now, 30 years into the future, when you walk around the development, 
there are lovely trees and it creates a brilliant neighborhood. I think the skills people are going to have to understand are these sustainability skills. Just because we cannot yet measure the impact of social inclusion, diversity, wellness, happiness, satisfaction, that the, the built environment can, can and, and you know, real estate organizations, prop tech companies can influence doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. Because I think in 30 years time, if you've created a building, you've created an environment, you've created a culture that has these brilliant values, it will pay dividends. Just because you can't measure it yet doesn't mean you shouldn't be putting it in place immediately. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that. I'm just sort of concerned about sort of the time and I think we might have just broke a quarantine record by doing a whole interview of our question on COVID-19, which is obviously a very sort of hot topic at the moment. I was sort of eager to avoid avoid the C word as it seems to be what everyone is talking about. But with that in mind, obviously it's it's changed real estate significantly in the past few months. Andrew, what do you think will be the next unforeseen shock of real estate that real estate will have to endure? You know, you know the answer to that already, don't you? The next unforeseen shock is unforeseeable, so I, I can't tell you. All, all I can tell you is that there's been a crisis in the financial markets and the property markets, I think every three or four years since 1997. So the idea that this is just a huge shock, which indeed it is, but a huge shock that won't be repeated is, is, is just wrong. You know, we've had 97, we had the Asian debt crisis, we then had the dot-com boom and bust 99, 2001. Mm. Then we had the SARS crisis 2003, then we had the global financial crisis, then we had the Greek debt crisis, then we had Brexit, then we had COVID-19. So every three or four years, something big happens that's unforeseen. And, you know, there'll be another one in three or four years time, no doubt. And it means that it means that businesses have to work out what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. And, you know, good buildings, good urban environments are probably sustainable in most scenarios, you know. So a lot of nonsense being talked at the moment about the end of the city you know, the end of densification, the fact that everybody will work from home and work in the suburbs, completely wrong, in my opinion. I don't think that's a forecast. I think it's just using an analysis of all the forces of land economics that we know about, you know, migration, the demographic structure of the population, the need for the need for entertainment, housing, and the, the fact that we're a knowledge economy, you know, that it's not an accident that we're all in London and that there's a prop tech sector in London. And the reason it's there is because there's a, a knowledge agglomeration in London. And we all get more valuable as people by knowing more. And we know more by, not just by being online, but by meeting at breakfast, meeting at lunch, going to a seminar in the evening. And so, you know, the city will survive. That's the sort of the big thing that's going to come through all this. But but don't be surprised if there's another big shock in three or four years. Yeah. Um, Andy, would you agree with this? Andrew's knowledge of real estate is 1,000 <laughs> times anyone else's in the world, which makes it about a million times more than mine. Um, so I, I could only agree. Yeah. Most, most of what you hear me say, I've kind of discussed with Andrew in the office, and then I take out and tell other people, and goes, oh, you know a bit about real estate. And I sort of go, oh, yeah, no, I read it somewhere. You know, I've, I've taught myself, but I yeah. just, I just, I just hate Andrew's opinions. Serious copyright issues there, uh, Andy. <laughs> It's a serious question for you two. I mean, are you spooked by COVID to the point where you consider going and living in Wiltshire or in you know a town in Yorkshire somewhere in the Sticks? Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I love Yorkshire and the Sticks, and I love Wiltshire, you know, and I and I would go and live there, but I'm I'm old, you know. I just don't see young people wanting to do anything else than congregate in dense urban environments. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I, I know, I know my team and. Th- basically all my sort of clients whether they're you know large set or large scale sort of consultancies to startups everyone's missing that sort of human interaction it's just being in the same space you know bouncing off like different ideas just communicating with people and then I completely think I agree that you get more work done when you have a couple of days to yourself I get so much more done than when I'm not on an office full of you know 15 recruiters that goes without saying. But, you know, when it comes down to sharing ideas, you know, I think definitely half the week should you should be in an environment where you're surrounded by people. And I think also people coming out of universities, that's what people thrive off. They want to, they, they miss that culture, you know. Google and Facebook not going back to the office till next year. I think they're going to lose a lot of their talent. People buy into that whole culture piece. So, yeah, the sooner the better we can all get back to the office and 
the, I spoke to Gab from Equium and the, some of the tech and they're sort of going to be implementing into some of their buildings, which allows people to go back safely, you know, looking at sort of air quality and temperature and all of that. Then soon the better that sort of evolves, hopefully we can all resume as normal or yeah. slightly normal. <laughs> I'm quietly optimistic about it. But look, Andrew and Andy, this brings us to the end of the show. Um, I'd like to thank you um, once again for joining us on the PropCast. Before we go, is there anything you would like to share with um, our audience and listeners and also let, let them know the best way to connect with you? All your details will also be put in the podcast uh, summary at the bottom as well. Yeah, have a, have a look at the Future of Real Estate Initiative website at Oxford University. That would be, that would be great. And there's a LinkedIn site that Andy knows more about than I do. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 there is a LinkedIn group you can get on called the Oxford Future Real Estate Initiative. If you search that, request to join. We're going to try and make it an open group. We've had, we researched the future and all of the brilliance of technology, but we can't actually work our own LinkedIn pages. So um, we will <laughs> hopefully, hopefully get that a bit more open in the future so the research spreads a bit further and wider. Yeah, but otherwise that, everything we publish is on our website. And it's, it's amazing how many people message me saying, oh, can you please talk to me about tokenization? And I can just quite easily say, read this report. And then if you have any questions, yeah. we'll, we'll discuss it another time because um, there are some really, really good insights in, in, the, in those reports. Um, so yeah, have a read. So, okay, perfect. Well, look- I'm, I'm hoping that, that Andy has a great career in his next job and that whoever I hire to replace him doesn't get me arrested at our Christmas party as Andy did last year. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Sorry? Like, well, this well, You want to share one one parting bit of information and what happened there? <laughs> well, we, we sat down for, I, I said, you know, guys, it's, it's Christmas. We should all, you know, abstain. And, and in the true nature of Catholicism, we should have one glass of wine and a bite of bread. But Andrew forced, forced me to get drunk as my boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think my rugby days took, got the better of me. And we sat down for lunch at 12 o'clock and we left the table at eight o'clock in Oxford. And then we went to a pub. To, to continue continue drinking and this isn't just me making excuses and I and any children listening I don't condone this type of behavior but yes I, I, I don't remember much until my two policemen are stopping me trying to get on the train saying uh, can we have a word with you and I think there was an altercation in one of the pubs which I again is highly out of character for me but yeah these these things happen I, these, I was these things do happen <laughs> uh, we've had a few beers Louisa you've seen how much yeah I'm yeah, no, exactly. Um, <laughs> Andrew, you're going to have to find a new social set for your um, research team, though. Um, oh, it's going to be very boring from now on. <laughs> um, if only, if only there was a recruiter on the call that could look out for real estate researchers for you, Andrew. Yeah, everyone, send me your CV. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you guys once again for coming on the PropCast. And I will um, share all the details of this in the link below. But thank you. Thank Cheers, Louisa. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this week on the PropCast and a big thanks to our special guests. Make sure you visit our website, www.nmre.co.uk, where you can subscribe to our show or you'll find us on iTunes and Spotify where all good content is found. Whilst you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate if you could rate and review us on iTunes or if you simply just spread the word. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday and I'll catch you later. You're listening to a podcast company podcast. This was made by Podcast Syndicator, where we help you go from start to grow to making money with your podcast. Let us help you share your message and your voice with the world. Reach out now, Jason at podcastsyndicator.com or Brett at podcastsyndicator.com to find out more. Thank you for listening and do come back to hear nothing but the best podcasts.